In putting together this website for teacher development, for teacher training, we had a strong mission to really demonstrate the latest uh, in neurocognitive science related to learning, to really demonstrate the implications of the Carnegie Foundation National Study of Nursing Education. And so it might be useful uh, in watching the website to review these integrating um, concepts and research. There, there is a kind of coherence in the website and the excellent uh, teaching that you're going to observe. And of course, I can't cover everything that you will see on the website, but this may give you some insights. For example, in the Carnegie study, we realized that nursing education had really focused on narrow, rational, technical model of education in which uh, the idea was to break the complex down to the simple. And that's a very good educational maxim for the absolute novice in nursing school. But very quickly, even by the time the student is in the second year of nursing school, you need more than breaking things down in the simple uh, elements. You need to begin teaching the student to recognize the nature of the whole situation. And there's a lot of background neuroscience. Um, Jean Lave's work at, at UC Ber Berkeley um, and a lot of uh, thinking has gone into how clinicians think, how human beings think that's so different than how computers or formal decision-making models would guide your thinking. So it's really the difference between what Aristotle would have called techne, or things that you can standardize, uh, uh, turn into procedures, and make them generalizable, versus phronesis, or uh, clinical judgment. Phronesis is that uh, contrast term from the Greek to techne or technical. But uh, phronesis represents reasoning across time about the particular through changes in the situation and or changes in the person's understanding of the situation. It really represents a kind of wisdom that comes from experience. And of course, given my um, 30 years immersed in the Dreyfus model of skill acquisition, um, which is a model of experiential learning, uh, whereby the person is now using past whole concrete experiences as a way of entering and recognizing the nature of the situation. One of the ways of thinking about the Dreyfus model of skill acquisition is that through uh, through experiential learning, you come to live in quite a different world. And the perfect analog for that is what it's like to enter a new culture or begin to speak a new language. Uh, at first, everything is quite objectified and matching the textbook with the situation until you begin to embody the language. It's, um, it's, it becomes natural to say, hola instead of hello, um, you dwell in a new uh, human life world when you go to a new culture. Well, the same is true when you develop new skills. You begin to be able to see new things based on your past experiential learning. And so the thinking behind uh, how human beings develop skills and how skilled know-how is a way of embodying knowledge permeates this website. The other thing that uh, has kind of interesting history that is uh, a focus of the website and exemplified by our teachers is that notion of gaining a sense of salience. Well, when we first were using this, it comes right out of the Dreyfus model, we, uh, our colleagues at Carnegie would say, say what, salience, why are you using that term? Well, the reason is there's, we could find, maybe some of you can think of one, we could find no good alternative 
for salience, which is this taken for granted background understanding whereby you enter a situation and some things just stand out as more important and other things stand out as less important. It requires no assessment, but because of your deep background understanding of the situation, you have a tacit understanding, something that exists for you that changes your perception, changes your uh, capacity to see. So uh, while uh, a novice uh, student, one of my dear colleagues, gave me the example of dropping her pin into the wash water and suddenly having the patient become cyanotic, well, that's a novice mistake. No one would really, who is familiar with seeing cyanosis uh, in the flesh, would think of uh, the uh, coloring of cyanosis from bath water, uh, or the coloring of blue from bath water as, as ringing true as true cyanosis. It's that kind of experiential learning that's so linked into perception. So for clinical wisdom, clinical judgment, for discerning, perception is a key. Now in educational research, there's, there's an absolute re revelation, revolution going on both uh, to reveal the role of perception in getting you started in thinking. Part of the reason this comes out of the uh, Dreyfus model so clearly is that in, in the Dreyfus model, the early work that Bert Dreyfus did looking at why artificial intelligence, certainly the f early Turing machines, had so much trouble mimicking uh, expertise was because the computer always had to build things up element by element by element. That's an analog for your notion in education of making the complex broken into simple blocks. But the problem is clinicians, whether it be a physician, even a lawyer or a nurse or a social work, enters the situation and must, as Bourdieu points out, recognize the nature of the whole situation and begin to reason from there. If you don't have a recognition of the nature of the whole situation, which is exactly the problem the novice uh, first year nursing student faces, is that you have to figure everything out. You have, to, if you were in a culture, you would have to be translating rather than directly understanding or perceiving the situation. So the nature of clinical reasoning, phronesis, practical reasoning, these are all synonymous terms with us, is that you need to first start from a recognition of the nature, the salience in the clinical situation. If you don't do that as a human uh, thinker, you get into the same problem the artificial intelligence system has with representation and formal models of decision making because you run into the limits of formalism. In a complex situation, you can't make everything explicit. Um, some things have to be in the taken for granted background, in the tacit understanding that you bring to yourself, or in the computer lingo, the kind of common sense understanding of what things mean in the world that you're operating in. So that sense of salience has to do with perceiving what's most important to attend to in this situation. And notice how it's not just a rational calculation of setting formal priorities, it's honing in on the situation uh, to recognize what's most important and least important. The other central thing and theme in this website is the importance in any clinical practice is the experiential learning within the situation. Practice itself is viewed as a way of learning and understanding in its own right. In other words, it would be great if you taught all your students that they would be developing knowledge every time they go into the clinical situation if they are open to it, they then reflect on it, and they determine that they are going to experientially learn something new each time they enter 
the clinical practice. Now, experience can never just mean passage of time. Some people have the same experience over and over for far too many years. Experiential learning means that you are somehow brought up short, um, to use uh, the language of Kurtiman, uh, Deborah Kurtiman. You are brought up short. You, you go in thinking one thing and then suddenly it is clear to you that's not the right take on the situation. So uh, recognizing the nature of the situation can never have the kind of Cartesian certainty we're always hoping for uh, uh, using a template matching onto the situation, but it's far more flexible and it's the only recourse we have for intelligent, wise action that is situated. So experiential learning means entering the situation and having your pre-understanding, your preconceptions turned around or nuances added to them. We will also emphasize a lot about consciousness raising and by that we mean the person can get a glimmer when they have something from their own familiar family background that they're bringing to the situation as a, a taken for granted understanding that simply doesn't work in nursing practice. Um, for example, one may come from uh, a family where uh, the decision in the family is that no one in this family gets angry. Well, that nurse will have a hard time uh, confronting and meeting many angry patients who are angry because of the recent illness or the recent injury they've incurred or the fact that their world is completely disrupted by their illness. So you start with where the student comes from. Anger is not a good idea um, and, and, and you try to lead them in to understanding anger as a form of coping. Uh, anger is often uh, occasioned by feeling helpless, and so the person gathers themselves together in angry anger in order to cope with their sense of helplessness. Uh, or, of course, it's also a way of lashing out at a sense of injustice, what's unfair. And as a nurse, one has to become comfortable with anger, with anxiety, with suffering. And probably these areas of skill of engagement and relational involvement with patients are of the most complex teaching we do in nursing. We found in our research on uh, the Dreyfus model of skill acquisition that nurses who were uncomfortable uh, with any sort of relational openness or uh, engagement with the patient simply couldn't go on to become experts. Why? Because by being uh, disengaged and uh, by not being open and responsive to the patient, they literally shut down the information that was coming to them from the situation. So they could speak to the situation, but the situation could not really speak to them. And that requires that kind of consciousness raising, um, that kind of recognition of uh, really, it's really a kind of diagnosis of what's impeding the learning here comes when in clinical situation or the simulation lab or even in a focused discussion in the classroom you realize that you need to give situated coaching and uncover the learning impediment for uh, the student. We know from the Lave and Wenger work uh, and uh, a lot of the neuroscience work that um, the kind of theoretical knowing that uh, way of thinking is uh, one kind of thinking. And yet, when you're in practical situations and you're required to use knowledge, it, that requires a different form of um, productive thinking. 
Uh, you, so we will be emphasizing integrating knowledge, knowing that, knowing about, with integrating that with knowing how. And we're going to recommend that you do that in the classroom and not just in the clinical or the simulation lab. So we're, we're really going to try to cultivate the habits of thinking that are required for nursing practice, um, the kind of situated thinking in action, uh, the, the kind of clinical imagination that enables the nurse or the student to call on the relevant science, the relevant facts in the situation. We are aiming for much like the new work, it's not so new, it's about 25 years old, but it's continuing and uh, really becoming of more interest in the hospital uh, situation is, is the notion of how do you practice for high reliability in very complex, rapidly changing situations like fighting a wildfire, like working in an ICU, or um, uh, working in a, a high-risk uh, mass casualty or uh, a trauma situation. There are different habits of mind and thought that yield reliability that are quite different from techne, from checklists, from uh, sort of systems engineering. It means that you have intelligent, wise clinicians thinking through and using wisdom based on family resist resemblances in the situation, based on f um, recognize the, this situation in a similar way um, that you experienced in a former trauma situation. It's this perceptual acuity that comes from being open and responsive and trying to um, really understand uh, the nature of the situations. Um, we do make in the book, Educating Nurses, a call for radical transformation, a distinction that was made in the clergy study and also in, in the medical study. And that's the distinction between uh, critical thinking, which is essential and is the major modus operandi in academia, but we need another uh, agenda, as William Sullivan and Matt Rosen have pointed out. We need an agenda of practical reasoning. And when I say practical, I mean clinical. Reasoning across time about the particular through changes in the situation or changes in the clinician's understanding. Critical uh, thinking is also very important but its use is primarily when you have extreme breakdown, when the received view isn't working, when you are doing something wrong or something that's just not giving you good out outcomes over and over, and you have to then step back, engage in critical reflection, and come up with a solution to what's causing the breakdown. But for example, when you enter a, a code blue or resuscitation situation, you don't really engage in critical thinking. Now, I know that sounds heretic because we're, we're used to thinking of every good kind of astute, virtuous thinking as being critical. But in, in a, a situation like a resuscitation where all the variables are uh, come close in, the patient's in a life-threatening uh, situation. You have to really attend to the algorithms of uh, CPR. You have to really think about, um, uh, do you have circulation? I'm thinking of the examples from the battlefield where circulation may be even more important than respiration because if you're having mass hemorrhage, um, it doesn't doesn't help to try to push uh, fluid around if there's no fluid there, or um, if you don't have any blood on board to oxygenate. So it's this kind of situated thinking in action that's really based on um, clinical reasoning across time, 
uh, it's a kind of modus operandi, I think, a kind of MO. Well, this happened, the person has lost his leg, it's massive hemorrhage, this is what we have to do. Versus coming upon someone in the hospital who's having a, a, a cardiac arrest or respiratory resp arrest, you usually know quite a bit about the history that's brought this on. We are recommending in all of these uh, all of these examples of teaching that instead of imagining that you have one frame of reference, like the the medical model or the allopathic uh, diagnostic frame, that you also have that human frame of the patient's experience of illness and breakdown, of the patient's coping, of the patient's concern or how development might be influencing this situation, or how aging might influence this situation. We went through a period of a very narrow rational technicality when we thought we would get one large grand range theory that would help us figure out any situation by just using it as a, a kind of problem solving device that we set on top of the practice situation. We are trying to teach a much more reliable, inductive approach to the situation where we teach for clinical imagination, where we teach for the student learning from practice every time they enter a simulation or a clinical um, practice situation. So we're trying to bring about a broader view of rationality um, and not just formal criterial thinking, but very situated thinking in the world of clinical practice where there are very many qualitative distinctions, important historical uh, patient history issues. And so you'll find that is permeated. And I'm hoping that by just summarizing some of this deep background of research that it will help you notice it when you come across it in the many teaching examples.